Well, good afternoon, church. I want to welcome you to our online prayer gathering. Uh, we will be meeting tonight at 6 and looking forward to that time when we pray together as a church family and uh, praying for our nation. We're having a special time of prayer uh, for our nation and uh, also for individuals that we know of that will be uh, that just need prayer. And So hope you can join us tonight. We're continuing our, our study of the book of Revelation. We're, uh, we've reached chapter 13. We're going to actually be looking at verses 1 through 10. And, and thinking about the theme, uh, a, a world leader emerges. My own personal conviction is that as John was writing this, he was writing about a nation that he knew about. Um, he knew about the Roman Empire, and he knew about the leaders, particularly during his lifetime. Uh, and so, you know, they we're talking about the dragon that is, uh, that is uh, calling the shots with someone called the beast or a a country or an empire named the beast or called the beast. And then there's a second beast that comes along. And uh, my personal conviction is the, the beast that has multiple heads. I, I think that he's referring to two leaders uh, of the Roman empire that he knew of that led during his lifetime. Nero, for one, who was uh, instrumental in killing uh, Peter, uh, the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul. Um, certainly John was very aware of that situation. Um, and then Domitian, there were a couple, uh, th I think three between those two, but they were very short reigns. And then Domitian had a very long reign, and he was the one more than likely that was reigning when John was writing the book of Revelation. And so I think the Holy Spirit was using that, but, but I also think that it's a, re it's a recurring theme throughout history. I think there's always going to be world leaders that are anti-Christ, that are against Jesus. I think there's going to be ultimately one anti-Christ uh, that will be a world leader, that will have tremendous uh, influence for the negative, and that, um, that, that, uh, that will bring about the, the return of Jesus. And so um, I want to read through this. We're going we're to look at this world leader that emerges. We're going to make three observations about him. First of all, he is very powerful. You know, the question is, how, how in the world can, can a world leader be so powerful against Jesus, uh, contrary to Jesus? If God's sovereign, well, he allows it. He allows this to happen as, as a so, uh, part of judgment uh, as a result of the choices that the world makes. And, and so uh, this world leader uh, emerges, this, this empire, this country emerges, and it's controlled by the dragon. We've seen that the dragon is the devil. And so the devil has tremendous authority, and we have to understand that. He, he was a, a former archangel, we believe. He gained authority when a third of the angels, uh, we believe, a third of those stars were swept out of the sky by his tail. Um, we know that he has Angels that have chosen to side with him. We don't know how many. Um, we don't know what percentage. The, we, as we said, maybe as many as a third. He gave him authority. He also gets authority when people obey him. When we choose uh, contrary to the will of the Lord, we're choosing in favor of the will of the devil. And so that gives him authority. That gives him the right to wreak havoc in, in the lives of, uh, in our lives, the lives of people. And so the greater the degree a person is disobeying Jesus, the greater degree they're obeying the devil. And that gives him authority. That gives him a power. And so when you've got a world leader who is refusing to submit to Jesus in his ways, um, and that leader is, is doing the devil's bidding, doing what, the, what Satan is motivating him to do, then it just creates horrific trouble, horrific problems. And so the devil has this authority. Now, if I were to ask you, what is the most powerful, what is the most powerful institution on the planet? Would it be a corporation? Would it be a country? What institution would be the most powerful, the most influential? I think the answer would be government. I think government is the most powerful. And so because of that, the devil desires to control governments. And how does he do that? Well, by influencing who's appointed or who's elected, and then by influencing them through their leadership. And so 
I think that's what the, the, the chapter 13 in the book of Revelation is all about, is a world government leader um, that was wreaking havoc because they were doing the devil's bidding instead of doing Jesus' bidding. And so let's read about this. Like I said, I think specifically I, my personal conviction, there would be many that would disagree with me, I believe he's writing about the Roman Empire, uh, but, but this recurring theme that we see throughout human history and that will continue until the ultimate beast, the ultimate antichrist uh, appears. So uh, let me read it and we'll make some observations as we go along. Hopefully you've got your Bible and you'll be able to follow along with me. As I said, we're going to go through verse uh, 1 through 10. So uh, verse 1 says, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Now, um, the, the, the city of Rome was on the sea, on the Mediterranean Sea. And so I think that that's an allusion perhaps to the city of Rome and the Roman Empire. It says, I saw the beast coming out of the sea and it had 10 horns and seven heads with 10 crowns uh, on its horns uh, and, and on each head a blasphemous name. And so um, you're depending on how you count the Caesars, the, the emperors in, in Rome, some of them were very short-lived, some of them were longer. So you, it could be you're on the seventh, uh, and it could be you're on the 11th uh, emperor, depending on your perspective and how you really recognized whether a guy was really the emperor or not. But um, So anyway, the, you've got these seven heads, uh, ten horns, and, uh, and ten crowns. Uh, verse 2 says, The beast I saw resembled a leopard, which is a very swift animal, uh, but he had the feet like a bear, so bear would represent very powerful, very strong, and a mouth like that of a lion. Now, interesting, in verse 5, um, he says, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. And so the, the lion, the mouth of a lion is just very boisterous, very arrogant, very egotistical, very blasphemous. And I think that's the, the symbolism there of the, the mouth of a lion. Um, it says, The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And so the dragon, obviously the one behind him, verse 3, uh, one of the heads seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Now, I believe that that's a reference to Nero. Nero didn't have a fatal wound on his head that we know of, but under his leadership, the Roman Empire nearly failed. I mean, it was right on the brink of failure. He was just so erratic, so ungodly, so immoral, and did horrific, unimaginable uh, things. And so I think maybe that's what John is referring to when he's talking about this fatal wound uh, that seemed to have healed. Somehow the Roman Empire survived the reign of Nero, and, um, and he wound up committing suicide because of the opposition that, uh, that he had received. It says, uh, verse 4, people worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. Now, the beast, I don't see that as, as a particular emperor. I see the beast as the Roman Empire and the seven heads uh, as the emperors that led that. One of those heads, who was Nero, had a, this fatal wound, the, 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 the empire nearly collapsed under his leadership. And, uh, and, and, but I also think at times the beast does refer, he uses that beast because they're a beast within the beast of the Roman Empire. And so I, I think he uses them somewhat interchangeably. But, uh, but the devil, he's saying the devil is the one that's, the, the dragon is the one that's behind the authority of the Roman Empire, the beast. And it says they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? And of course, that was the Roman Empire. Nobody could defeat the Roman Empire. Nobody could could uh, wage war against it. And uh, it was very common knowledge that the emperors encouraged the, uh, people to worship them. And uh, so I think it's a reference.
reference to that. But verse 5 says, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies to exercise its authority for 42 months. And we see that in 42 months, it would have to be figurative in this case if, we, if it is talking about the Roman Empire because we know the Roman Empire lasted, lasted much more than 42 months. And so that would be one objection to someone that have, would have a different interpretation. No, it can't be uh, because three and a half years, uh, you know, Nero, uh, he reigned, uh, what, he reigned uh, 14 years. And uh, Domitian, who there were actually three very short-lived, I think three very short-lived emperors between them, but, uh, but Domitian, Domitian, who was reigning when John was writing, uh, he reigned for 15 years. Um, and he would then be the second head or another head or maybe the second beast that was described uh, here. So neither one of them reigned only three and a half years. So three and a half years, as I, as I said, half of seven. So it's a significant period of time, but not a, an indefinite period of time uh, would be under this interpretation. Verse six says, uh, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and so slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in them. So very blasphemous. This was Nero. He's very blasphemous. Um, as I said, killed Peter, killed Paul and uh, thousands and thousands of other believers. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And that's what it appeared, that Nero had waged war against Christians and he appeared to be overpowering them. He was wreaking havoc. He seemed to be winning uh, that battle. It was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So there again, you're looking at a one-world power Roman Empire had taken over the, the vast majority of the known world, couldn't wage war. Nobody could beat them at this particular time. And uh, so it had tremendous authority. And I believe, as I said, that's a recurring theme. We're going to see that over and over. There'll be empires, countries that emerge and they're very dominant. Uh, I think the United States is in that position at this point. Um, you know, China's making a resurgence. Russia's making a resurgence. So who knows what the future is going to hold. But there's always going to be a world power. Uh, and the, 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 that power either serves Christ or it serves the dragon, serves the devil. And so we have to make that decision as to, uh, as to whose side we're on. And, but ultimately, there's going to be a one world power. And that ruler is going to be, I think, again, the, 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 the described as the beast, as we see in this, in this, uh, this um, context. So it says, verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And so everybody was encouraged to worship the Roman emperor at that time. And again, in the future, there will be a world power, a, uh, a world leader that people will be encouraged to worship. You say, well, I'll never worship the beast. Well, we've got to remember that in a sense, when we obey Jesus, we're worshiping him. And when we obey the devil, then we're worshiping him. And anytime we disobey Jesus, we're obeying the devil. And so it's not that inconceivable that people will worship this one world leader. Uh, it says, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, whoever has ears, let them hear. Um, and so... Uh, it says, all of the ha inhabitants of the earth, I'm sorry, verse 8, all the inhabitants of those will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, it's interesting. So I was reflecting on this and thinking back about all we've talked about. I'm wondering if the Lamb's book of life is the book, the scroll that we had at the beginning with the seven seals, and that that was going to be revealed, whose name was written in the Lamb's book of life was going to be revealed when those seals were all broken, when those uh, tragedies all took place. And uh, it's interesting that it's referred to because he refers to him as the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. And kind of an allusion back to that scripture uh, where it's saying no one was worthy, but there was a lamb found to be worthy, one who was slain, who appeared to be slain. And so it'd be interesting because it was never revealed in that context what the contents of that book was. It just said it was written on both sides and there were seven seals. So maybe it is the uh, the the land book and it, and it's and it, to me it would be very encouraging because it was written on both sides so there would be a ton of people who are, whose name is written in the lamb's book of life and we saw that there was more than could be counted there worshiping before the throne and we've already seen that 
Verse 10, if anyone is, uh, is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And so we see that the, this, this world leader, very, very powerful. Uh, we see people worship not only the beast, but also uh, the dragon. And we see that his reign re- re- uh, needs and results in requires patient endurance and and faithfulness and so as we think on this and and whether whether you believe this is the roman empire or whether you believe this is yet some empire some world ruler uh yet to come which i believe both i believe that specifically it's about the roman empire but also this recurring theme that will play itself out over and over and over throughout human history until uh, the culmination and one ultimate antichrist uh, takes, the, takes the, the, his position of authority, the dragon giving him that authority and brings uh, life as we know it here on the earth to an end. So uh, I want to lead us in prayer. Uh, we're grateful that you joined us this afternoon. Look forward to our time together tonight. But let me, let me lead us in a time of prayer. Father, I just uh, am grateful for your word. I'm grateful that you uh, reveal to us not only what was taking place back then, but also what will take place in the future. And only you could, could orchestrate a book like this. And so I pray that we would be observant. I pray that we would be very careful, that we would not participate in the process of uh, the dragon having any influence on our government. We know we have a large responsibility through elections and and, uh, things of that nature. And I pray that we would be very cautious uh, knowing that the dragon has tremendous authority and he can give that authority to, to governments. And I thank you that we live in a country where we uh, can make that decision as a people and pray that you would help us to make those, uh, those wise decisions so that you might maintain control of our country and, and uh, just guide us as we make those decisions. And uh, Lord, I know that uh, COVID is, is kind of on the spread. I know that a lot, a lot of people have been diagnosed. I pray for each one who has been diagnosed. I pray that you would help us to be careful and not spread it any worse than it, it by nature spreads. And uh, Lord, we know that this certainly could be one of those plagues that we see in the book of Revelation. We know that, that uh, these situations and circumstances are certainly uh, common in the book of Revelation and, and pray that you would give each of us ears to hear what you're saying to us. We pray for all those on our prayer list that you would meet their needs, whether it's for physical healing or financial provision. We pray that you would meet their needs and that they would know that it's you that's met that need. And if there's any of them that don't know you, I pray that through this challenging time, they would come to know you. Any of their friends or family that doesn't know you, when they see how you move in these situations and the, and the example of those who are experiencing needs, that they would be inspired to trust you as Savior and Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and raising from the dead. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you to understand that Jesus loves you. He proved it by dying on the cross for your sins. He's powerful, and he proved that he died for our sins by raising from the dead. And the Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you've never done that, I pray that you'll do that now. Thank you for joining us. God bless you, and uh, I pray that uh, you have a great afternoon.